Hello and welcome. I'm Dave. Today we will learn about closures in Python, and I'll provide links to all resources in the description below. I've got VS Code open, and you can see I have a new empty folder named Lesson 12, and that's where you will find this lesson in the course resources. Let's create a new file named closure.py. C-L-O-S-U-R-E dot P-Y. P -Y. So now we've got our new file, and let's talk about closures for just a moment, because closures are often a difficult concept for beginners to understand. But I think I can provide a simple example in this lesson that will help you always remember what a closure is. And it's important to understand scope first, and that was covered in the previous lesson in this series. So if you've found this video, but you haven't learned about scope yet, I suggest going to the previous video in this playlist and learning about scope first. Let's define what closure is. I'll just paste this definition in and it looks like I need to put another comment before the second line. And I'll even press Alt Z to wrap this down and it looks like I should just fit this on the second line as well. So Control X to cut, Control V to paste, and there we go. So let me scroll this back up. There we go. Closure is a function of having access to the scope of its parent's function after the parent function has returned. That sounds complicated at first, but if we break this down, we're talking about a parent function. So that means you should know we're going to have a nested function defined. And we learned about those in the previous lesson with scope. And then the nested function is going to have access to the scope of its parent function. And of course, let's go ahead and create an example. So I'm going to come down one line and use the def keyword, and then let's just call this parent underscore function. And this will be our function. It's going to receive one param to start out with, and that will be a person. And now we can define the body of the function. So let's say we have coins, and this coins is equal to three, then just the number three. Now let's define a nested function. And here I'm going to use the def keyword again and call this play underscore game. And now inside of our nested function, we're going to use that coins variable from the parent function. So we'll use non-local as we learned about in the scope lesson and say coins. So we're going to use that and we'll set the coins equal to minus one. It's essentially equal to itself minus one. We learned about how to do that. So we don't have to say coins equals coins minus one. We can just put a negative and then the equal sign, and it will accomplish the same thing. So we're subtracting one from coins at this point. Essentially, we had to put a coin in the game to play the game. And now let's put some logic here with an if statement. So I'll say if coins is greater than one, now we can go ahead and print something for our output. So let's print and we'll start with a new line. So that's a slash in. Let's give it a, well, not, we don't need a space yet, but we will. So let's give it a plus here, put the person's name. So we're just starting out on a new line with the person's name that's passed in. And now we'll have a space, the word has, and then another space. And after that, we'll put another plus. And now remember to use coins, it's not a string. So we need to wrap it here in our constructor for string, and then we'll just pass in coins, whatever that value is, and it should be greater than one at this point. And then we'll put plus, and now another space, and we'll say coins space left. So we're just making a statement here. If we passed in my name, and then it would call play game, which it's not calling yet. We're just defining play game at this point. But if we got to this point here in our if statement, it would say Dave has two coins left because I started with three. So now let's put an else if here. And our elif is essentially what an else if is in Python. We'll say coins equals one. And the reason we're doing this for one is because then we don't want to say coins left. We just want to say coin left. So let's copy this with control C, paste it here as well. And now let's just change this to coin left. So now this would be Dave has one coin left because this will only happen if coins is equal to one. And finally, let's put an else here. So this would be anything else. And essentially, if it was greater than one, the first happened. If it's equal to one, the second happened. So here our else would be zero or anything less than one, essentially. And now I'll just paste this again, but I'm going to change the message. So instead of has whatever coins left, now I'm going to say 
is out of coins because at that point, we shouldn't really be able to play the game anymore. We would be out of coins. Now, as just an example function, we're not really tying a game to this. We're just going to get this output printed to the console. But after we're finished here defining our play game function, then we need to come back to the parent function, essentially. And instead of returning any value, we're going to return the play underscore game function. Notice we're not calling it into action by putting the parentheses after it. We're just returning this nested function play game when we call the parent function. So now that we've completed our parent function, let's go ahead and use it. And I'm going to say Tommy here for our first variable. And as a parent function, let's say his father gives him three coins to go to the arcade. So here we'll just pass in Tommy's name because that's what the function needs to receive. We're already defining the coins value inside the function here. And then we're going to be able to call Tommy because Tommy is a function because we're returning the play game function here when we call the parent function and it has the value of Tommy for the person's name. Now notice we're not changing the value of person and that's why we don't have to use the non-local uh, coins here like we did with coins, essentially the non-local keyword with coins, but we are changing the value of coins and that's why we must use the non-local keyword with coins, but we don't have to use it with person because Tommy's value stays the same or whoever's name we pass in. And as a matter of fact, let's say Tommy has a sister. So we'll just copy this down. I'm going to highlight Tommy, change this to Jenny, which would be his sister's name. And let's say uh, their dad, gives both of them three tokens to go to the arcade and play games with. So every time we call one of them into action is when they're going to play a game. So let's copy Tommy down. He's going to play the game a couple of times and then we'll have Jenny play a game. So let's save all of this now and notice we're calling our function Tommy twice and Jenny once. Let's check the output. I'm also going to press control B to hide the file tree for now, just so we can have some extra room here when we see the output. We'll go to our drop menu, run the Python file, and it says Tommy has two coins left, then Tommy has one coin left because he played twice, then Jenny still has two coins left. So I'm going to move this over to the right also. We'll go to view, appearance, and now we should be able to go to panel position and then I'll choose right so it's not at the bottom so we can see our code just a little better. But when we did this, we called Tommy twice and he used one coin, so he had two left. Then he used another coin, he had one left. But Jenny was able to go ahead and play once and she still has two coins left. So you can see how we're keeping different values in coins inside of the scope of the parent function that our play game function can go ahead and access the value of even when we change that value. That's what a closure is. And the closure is created when the parent function returns. So when we return this, then the closure is created and play game, the nested function, will always have access to the variable value that is in the parent function. And it's not always three. It can change that value as we're accessing it and changing it right here. So let's go back to our definition and see if it makes a little more sense. So a closure is a function having access to the scope of its parent. So play game has access to the scope of the parent function even after that parent function has returned. And that's what's necessary here. So the parent function returns the play game function and then the play game function has access to the scope of that parent function every time we call play game. And it's not always the same as we noted here, Tommy and his sister have different values for how many coins they have left. And if we called Tommy again, he's going to run out of coins. So let's save and run this code once again. And now Tommy's out of coins. Jenny still has two coins left. So now just to change our example a little bit, let's go ahead and comment out coins here and let's have our parent function receive a specific number of coins as well. So as a second param, we're going to pass in the coins. So that way the parent can award the children different amounts of coins. So now that we have changed that, the coins is still 
inside of the scope of the parent function. It's a param of the parent function at this point. So I just wanted to show essentially how we could move coins up here as a param and the same concept still applies. So now when we call these functions, Tommy, well, he did okay, but he didn't do all of his chores. So he just gets three coins, but let's say Jenny did all of her chores and she gets five coins for the arcade. So let's save this and let's go ahead and rerun our code. And now Tommy has two coins, one coin. Jenny has four coins left after she uses one and Tommy is out of coins. So the same applies to a param as if we had defined the variable inside of the parent function here. So if you remember in our scope lesson, I had said that it's really a good idea to avoid global variables when possible. And notice we didn't have to create a global variable here. So really creating a nested function and using closure, accessing a value from the parent function is one good way to avoid creating global variables, but when you need to access a variable from a parent still. So this just creates another level. So now let's look at an example with our rock, paper, scissors game that we have been adding to throughout these lessons. So it was changed in the last lesson. So I'm going to start with the code from the previous lesson of where we left off our rock, paper, scissors game. So I'll open up the file tree and this will be the fifth version. So I'm going to call this rps5.py and I'm going to paste in the code from the last lesson where we had modified this. But if you remember, we created a global variable here called game count, and we were counting the number of games we played. But now we should be able to change this to where we're not going to use a global variable. And the first step is going to be to wrap our play RPS function inside of a parent function. And we'll do that with the game count here too. So above this, I'll just call this RPS instead of play RPS. And now, we have essentially wrapped this, but we need to change our indentation because that's important in Python. So I'm going to indent the game count here, and this will be inside of the scope of the RPS function. And then let's select everything else. So on my line nine, all the way down to the bottom here, I'm going to press shift and click, and then I'm just going to tab over. But really, I didn't need to tab this play RPS. We can go ahead and change that because it's not going to be play RPS anymore. Notice when I backspaced, it got this squiggly line from VS Code because now play RPS is not in the global scope where we can call it. It's a nested function. So we're going to be calling a function called RPS when we actually do call everything into action. Let's scroll back to the top because we need to make a few more changes. Besides the game count, now let's count how many games the player wins and how many games Python wins. So I'll also create a variable here called player wins, set that equal to zero, and one called Python underscore wins and set that equal to zero. Now let's remove this extra line, but what we're going to need to do is pull these uh, variable values into the play RPS function because we will be modifying these by adding to this uh, number we have, of course, starting with zero. So we will increment as Python wins or as the player wins, and of course, for each game with game count. So what we need to do here is go ahead and use our non-local and then say player underscore wins, and we could say non-local and say Python underscore wins. Now we could do this with game count here as well, but if you remember, we had this lower in our code. So let's find that. I'm going to use control F and then just type game underscore count to see where else it shows up in the code. And we can see it's on line 52. So now that I'm here, I can't use this global keyword anymore because game count is not a global variable. It's inside the scope of the parent function RPS. So we're also going to use the non local keyword here for game count as well. Now let's scroll back up and remember we already had a nested function and that's okay. So now we have a nested function inside of a nested function. It just creates another layer. But when we do that and we need to access our player wins or our Python wins variable inside of our decide winner function that is nested inside of our play RPS function, 
you might guess that we're also going to have to use the non-local keyword here to pass it down one more level so we can modify these values inside of decide winner and then still access those values outside of decide winner when we need to. So I'm going to say non-local player wins and non-local Python underscore wins here as well. So again, a nested function inside of a nested function. Now, if we win, it says you win or the player wins, we'll say player underscore wins, and then we'll say plus equals one. So we're incrementing by one. Now I'm just going to copy this because clearly the same output is here as well. And it's also here. Now we don't really need to count the tie games, so we won't put anything else there. But in our else where Python wins, we can go ahead and paste one more time, but we'll just change this now to Python underscore wins. And now we're adding one if Python wins to this variable. So now that we've changed those, we just need to output the result also. So let's scroll down just a little bit and here we find our output for game count. And then of course we're using the string constructor around game count because it's a number so we can output it this way. I'm just going to shift alt and the down arrow to copy that down and now we'll count the player wins right here. So I'll say player wins. And let's change this to our player wins value. So player underscore wins. And now shift alt and the down arrow one more time. We'll change player to Python there. And we'll change player to Python here also. And now you would think we are finished, but there's one important thing that we have not done yet. And that's create the return for our RPS, which needs to return our play RPS. So remember our parent function here, RPS, needs to return the play RPS function. So now I'll scroll almost all the way to the bottom. And at the very end of our function here, this is where we'll need to go ahead and return the play RPS. And there we go. So return play underscore RPS. Remember, without the parentheses, we're not calling the function into action right there. We're just returning the function. So now let's define a new variable here called play, and we'll set this equal to our RPS function. And now play is going to hold the play RPS function. So now we'll call that into action. And now our game will start. So let's go ahead and play our game. I'll go to the drop menu and choose run Python file. It's ready for rock, paper, or scissors. I'll choose rock and it says a tie game. So why to play again? I'll choose rock again, another tie. So why to play again and another one. And let's three ties in a row. I cannot win right now, literally. Let's see. And hey, we finally won on the fourth game. Notice we have player wins one, but the game counts four. I also notice we have a slash here with Python wins. So I may have something in the code that I didn't want. Let's go back and check that out. And yes, we didn't get our in in there or I accidentally deleted it. That stands for new line. So let's put that back in. Now let's run the code again and we're ready to quit or uh, play again. So I'll say play again with the Y and now we're ready for rock, paper, scissors. I think I ran the code again when I actually didn't quit before and that's what happened. So let's quit because it's running the old version of the code. Notice the slash is still there. So we quit. Now let's go ahead and run that code again by pressing play up here. And I'm going to choose rock and Python wins. Game count one, player wins zero, Python wins one. Let's Play one more time, see if we can even it up, and we won. So game counts two, player wins, Python wins. You can see everything is counting as it should, and we've implemented closure to keep track of these game counts and the wins without actually creating a global variable at all. And you also learned how to use closure at two different levels there because we not only had one nested function, then we had a nested function inside of the other nested function. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day and let's write more code together very soon.